The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. All right, I'll start over. Uh, my name is Jim Smith, and I run a website for a TV station in Knoxville, WATE. The website, WATE.com, is not a Drupal site. It is actually a site that was built in a closed um, proprietary system that um, the corporate overlords um, hired this company to provide that service. And it's fine, you know, at, at least when you have a problem, you pick up the, call, the phone and call them, and they fix it. Um, but the downside is that it, it's you know, the kind of system where I don't have any access to the database. And, and in fact, a few years, until a few years ago, I didn't even have access to be able to change a CSS file. They had to do all that. So um, a number of years ago, I started looking around for a way that I could do pages on the site that were not in that system, but still looked like those, the site, so that um, I could do the things that I wanted to do, like display a really big weather image or create a fancy contest entry form or things that um, their system would not let me do. So I started looking around at different CMSs, um, all open source, because I didn't have any money to buy something. And um, Drupal was one of the ones that I looked at, and I didn't really much care for it, because it was hard to install, and it um, was just a little too arcane for what I was trying to do. And I, um, but I eventually went back to it, and by the time I went back to it, it had gone from version 4.5 to version 4.6, and suddenly it was easier to install. And, um, and then along came 4.7, and they started to introduce things like flexi nodes, which are now um, known as CC, CCK. And so um, I realize I'm kind of dating myself, but um, that um, really kind of um, led me to be able to not only do things like the pages that I couldn't do on that site, but also let me do things that um, are totally um, like one-off sites or do client sites. And, and um, so then I, um, um, uh, so I really kind of developed my um, interest in Drupal. As you see, I've been to a lot of the camps and, and spoken at a few of them. And, and uh, more recently, I started my own freelance company, and um, I do uh, sites, and I also do training. And uh, so today, I'm happy to say this is the last of my sessions for the week. It's not just, I, not, I did one earlier uh, today, but I did three earlier this week that were uh, two to three hours in length um, for a client. So I'm kind of um, done with talking for a while. Um, so. We're going to talk today about uh, what's sometimes referred to as BOA. And no, it is not Bank of America. Um, what we're talking about is Barracuda, Octopus, and Egger. So um, some of you are, um, probably are familiar with Egger. In fact, if you were in Zach's um, discussion earlier, there was, uh, or um, there was another presentation also about Egger, I believe. Um, or no, that was about Jenkins. Um, but Zach talked quite a bit in depth about Agar. Um, uh, in, the, in the case of this, what um, Omega 8 CC has done is taken the um, idea of Agar and kind of made it a, um, not only more robust, but easier to install on any server. Um, so, it's still at its heart an Agar system. Um, and Agar, um, if you didn't get a chance to um, hear Zach talk about it or if you aren't real familiar with it, it's a, um, it's a front end hosting solution. It manages and um, hosts um, sites and it does it in a way that is um, very um, or orderly and organized and, and very uh, safe for managing your sites. It allows you to um, do things like um, update a site very safely um, because 
it, you, you follow a certain set of uh, steps to do that, that um, and then when, when you um, push um, the updates, um, if, if Egger at anywhere along the line sees any problem with that setup, it will roll back to um, the previous version. So um, you really don't, um, you know, if you follow the procedures right, you really don't um, run much risk of, of messing up your site. Um, so what the B part of uh, BOA, um, Barracuda does, is it takes Egger and it sets it up on a specific server configuration. Um, it uses Nginx, which is a replacement for Apache. It uses a fast version of PHP, and it uses MariaDB. If you were in Eric Webb's um, presentation this morning, you may have heard him discuss all of the three of those um, a little bit. He mentioned them, and he mentioned them in terms of this is where um, people are going when they start to want to think about performance. Um, and Barracuda takes care of all of that for you um, it, it, when it installs on your server. Um, I, I should back up and say one thing about all this. I'm talking, when I talk about these things, as if I know about them. I don't really know that much about them. I'm not a system, system administrator. I don't try to pretend to be one. All I am is a guy who needs to run sites, build sites. Um, I've got clients that don't always necessarily want to go um, out for hosting because then they kind of have to um, maintain some of that control. So I host their sites and I charge them a little bit of a fee to kind of maintain them as well as host them. So um, for me to be able to do that, I need something that I can manage and, and be safe and secure about. And I also need it to be low cost. And so um, I, I, I have been using this system both at, at my TV station job and in my freelance job to be able to manage um, these sites and do it at a very low cost because we're talking about just buying um, like a VPS, um, which is a, a fairly inexpensive way of getting into what would other be um, like, you know, you're running your own server or whatever. Um, so what, what um, Octopus then does on top of Barracuda is it um, creates um, new instances or satellite instances of Agar. Um, and again, this is done just with a bash script. All of this that Barracuda and Octopus do is done by just running a script. But the other thing that um, Octopus does is it allows you to real easily uh, make use of um, distributions of Drupal. So it's not just your basic Drupal, it's any, pretty much any of the uh, distributions that are out there. That's, I've just listed a few, but um, I, can, I can see uh, OpenBlog being on there um, sometime soon. Um, but if you decided that you wanted to run OpenBlog and it was not part of Octopus at this point, it would still be possible to um, run that. You can run any Drupal site on, on a server that's running um, this setup. So uh, the, there's um, the, uh, lots of extras and lots of unique things that are um, added in in terms of this, this setup and a few surprises along the way as well. So it's, it's um, it, it, plus it, it gives you some real direction as to, to, um, to how to set it up. So that's, that's the advantage that I see about this. It's, it's really easy to set up. Um, and, you know, and I mean, it, it, it's, it's the, a great deal. You know, how can you pass a deal like that? Um, so here's, here's step by step how, it, basically how to set up the VPS, um, which, or a dedicated server um, that to run the, um, the Egger um, set up with Barracuda and Octopus. Um, first, it's important to know that not just any VPS will work. There are some out there that are running a, what, what's called um, Virtuoso or Open v, uh, VZ that are, um, th they do a few things with the swap files, is what I understand. Again, I'm talking like I, I'm a sysadmin and I'm not. But um, uh, you, so you want to make sure that it's um, 
Zen, vServer, Linux, KVM, or VMware-based um, VPS, if that's what you're setting up. Otherwise, if you're setting up on a dedicated server, you don't want any kind of um, operating system uh, other than you're just uh, your base level operating system. And the, th the three that are recommended are um, Debian Squeeze, which is the latest version of Debian, and then the last couple of versions of Ubuntu. Um, and I've run it on both Ubuntu and Debian, and I really don't, I don't, can't say that there's any difference in either one of those. So it's, it's you know, if you're uh, um, selecting a VPS, maybe they only offer a, a certain ones. And I don't, it doesn't really matter whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit that I can tell. Um, the, another requirement is that you have to be able to have um, Git available, uh, access to Git through port 9418. Um, that, that's geeky stuff to me. I, all I know is that um, the, the company that I use, that's no problem. And there's an obvious with any of these you know, setups, you have a base level of RAM that um, probably is very minimal. Um, I mean, that, that, that would be very base. You'd probably want more than that, especially if you're running um, uh, some sites that have a little bit more um, uh, like lots of pages being delivered, or um, then it, it, solar um, is is some an option if you want the the solar search setup. It, it, you can um, set that up very easily with this setup, but um, with with Barracuda, but you will need a much greater uh, um, amount of RAM for that. The other thing that the um, the requirements for Barracuda are list as they're listed on the uh, um, documentation. It says basic system and skills and experience are required. And you know, to me, I'm almost saying just screw it. Um, and and the, the reason why I say that is because you know I, I, I've made this point over and over. I'm not a sysadmin, and I'm doing it. And the way I was able to do all this is just make mistakes and start over. If you're, if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to just, um, it, you know, as long as you haven't put live sites on your setup until you're absolutely sure that it's running the way it should be and that you've set it up the, the way you're comfortable in putting live sites on, just set it up. Try it. Um, it's, it's very low cost to, to get a VPS up and running um, at uh, these, um, this kind of a configuration, and um, set it up. If it doesn't seem like it was set up right the first time, just uh, the, the, with the VPS is basically one button to um, to kill that setup and and set up it set it up again. It doesn't take very long to run the scripts and all that to to set up these up either. So once you've got you've bought your um, your VPS, um, you go t log into the uh, um, uh, the management um, back in, and you set up the domain of your server. You want to make sure that you've got the host record set up to uh, um, to uh, handle. Essentially, if you have the um, asterisk, then that can handle any subdomains of your domain. Then um, you have to go into your um, do domain register company's uh, site and tell them to find your site um, at your host company. And that's just a, you know you've probably done that with any site that you've built, um, so it's no, no different than um, what you've done there. Um, then just test it to make sure that um, you're you can, um, s that the internet can see your, si your server, um, ping or host um, will hit the server and if it bounces back that, that, um, that the domain matches the um, location of the server, then you're, you're good. Um, then you have to configure the server. The first thing you're going to want to do is log in as root. Um, that's the login that you're given when you're set up. So just 
um, login, and you want to first set up the host name for that. Um, that's just a couple of lines of code to be able to do that. Um, and then um, Zach has laid out um, some information that I uh, have to give him credit for um, in terms of setting up the uh, OpenSSH so that, um, you, that it, it, it's just a level of security that um, means that um, it, you're, I mean, the, the, the system itself is very secure, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but this gives you that one extra level of security, is, um, especially when it comes to something so important as your root, as you're using a uh, public private key. And, and, and to be able to log in, you, um, you have to have that uh, key set up not only on the server, but on your, your setup um, from where you're logging in. Um, so then there's one other um, aspect of that that Zach ha has recommended in his post, his blog post, and that is that you, um, you set it up so that you can only log in through this, using this public key. And there's the information that you need to uh, use for that. By the way, I've already published, uh, posted this um, presentation on the uh, Drupal Camp Charlotte um, listing for this session, so if you want any of this, you, uh, um, you don't have to write it down. Um, then just restart SSH and log in again using your public key. If, um, if you log in, you're good to go. If at some point you can't log in, you lost, you didn't get the setup right, you, you probably have to rest um, rebuild the, the server, but um, that would be, you know, again, just one of those mistakes that if you make it, it's, it's just a little bit of pain in setting it up again. Um, and you haven't done any installation of anything yet at this point, so it's, you're not talking about a lot of time. So next, um, step four is just read the documentation, and there is a lot of it. If you go to the project page, uh, drupal.org slash project slash barracuda, you pretty much get out all the information that you need right there. Um, there's an there's a, uh, install text file, there's a uh, readme text file, there's a hints text file, there's, there's lots of stuff. So seriously, just read this stuff. Um, there, there, there again is the project page. The next step is to download and run the Barracuda script. Now again, you're, you're logged in as root, and you, um, so all you have to do is go to, to the root directory, which you would have uh, if you were logged in that way. Um, run one line of code to download it, then, which is a bash script, and run the bash script. Um, and it, th this, this is a step that changed recently. Um, I, had to, I d gave the same presentation in Nashville at the Drupal camp there about a month and a half ago, and um, I had to redo the whole presentation because uh, some of this stuff changed, including that. Um, so um, that, one bit, that one line of code just basically just sets up the, um, the, the, the batch, bash script to um, be ready to handle being able to run Octopus and Barracuda. It used to be that you'd run Barracuda first and then Octopus. And let me back up one second because I'm not sure how well I explained this. Barracuda is an Egger instance and so is Octopus. Octopus is treated as a satellite instance, but they're all running basically on your same server. Although you, I guess conceivably you could run them on different servers, but with the way Barracuda and Octopus work together, I don't, I don't know how you would do that. Um, but I know, I know that you can with other sets, setups with, uh, um, with, with Egger, so um, conceivably, as I said, that's possible. So with this, um, with this one line um, uh, to run the script, you're telling the, um, the, the Barracuda Octopus Egger setup to run the, um, in this case, the instable version, there, which was essentially the same as um, the, the um, current released version as opposed to the head. Um, you're set up on public as opposed to um, a local host. You're running it on this domain and your email address. And there, are, if you um, want to, you can add to that um, 
a additional um, name there to set up your first instance of Octopus. Um, the, all that information is in the install.txt file. So just follow the directions and you'll be fine. If you, um, when, when you run that script, what it's doing is it's running everything that it is needed for Egger. It's, it downloads all the files needed for that, and it's setting up um, all that on either a MariaDB or a Percona server. I think the def, uh, database server, the, the, I think the default is MariaDB. If you wanted to switch to Percona, you can do that just by adding a, um, a switch in your, um, your script file. Um, the uh, Nginx web server, again, is, is tuned for delivering a little bit just faster, a little bit more. Um, uh, uh, it's also kind of set up to handle some of the other caching schemes a little bit better. Um, the fast um, PHP is there, and you can, um, it, two versions of that, so you, know, you definitely want the 5.3 if you're going to get into Drupal 7 and things like that. Um, the, uh, all the extras for fine tuning, including, uh, well, and now we start to get into this, a lot of the stuff that Eric talked about this morning. The Redis cache server, the new Relic, um, the, these are things that are already set up for you automatically when the server gets set up with Egger. You don't have to do a thing, and it's, it's all right there. Um, the, uh, Server is set up to do automatically, uh, automatically uh, run um, database backups. It um, then has a few little extras on top of that if you want them, like uh, Apache Solar. Um, it will even run your DNS for you as opposed to using another service for running the DNS. And there's two ways that you can do that. These are these are kind of experimental, and uh, I've never got into those, um, but they're there if you want to do them. Um, is, as an option, you can um, run Webmin, which is a, it's, if, if, if you've ever used cPanel or another way of getting access to a, a server through a user interface, Webmin is an open source version of that. Um, there is a firewall, which you I think you definitely would want for security. Um, there's, uh, Chive is the database manager which is very much like PHP MyAdmin. If you've ever used that, Chive is very much like it. Um, there's also uh, SQL Buddy as another database manager. So those are options you can select from if you want. And then um, you have a, a server monitor as well if you want to just kind of see some graphical um, displays of, of how your uh, server is performing. And then the other thing that um, that, that, that's part of Octopus is that every time you set up an instance of Octopus, it's setting up um, shell accounts for um, that instance that um, give you um, the, or the, give, if you want to, if like you have a client that you want to give the client access to some of this, um, it gives them access to the server um, through um, SFT, SF, FTP or FTPS, which are more secure ways of getting in rather than just FTP, and um, they um, they allow you to like if you wanted to um, uh, upload files or if you wanted to um, uh, run Drush or cer you know certain things that you 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 can do that but the number of commands that are allowed within these accounts is very limited. There's very um, narrow scope of the commands that are um, accessible, and there's only a, the narrow um, area of the server that they have access to. They don't have permission to be monkeying around with stuff that doesn't directly affect the, the sites that are on that part of the server. and um, they don't have any way of monkeying with uh, permissions and other things that an administrator would want to do. If you want to add an additional instance of Octopus, which you don't have to do, but if you wanted to, um, it's just a matter of running the this, this script again, but adding a new name um, 
for the, the new instance. And the, what I do, and I think to me this makes sense. I don't know if it makes, would make sense to everybody, but um, to me, I, I do run multiple instances of Octopus because what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I, I'm looking at it as this is my kind of like isolated area for that site or, you know, maybe it's actually more than one site or maybe it's like a, a test version and a, and a production version of the same site. Um, but I, I, the way I look at it is that I am giving myself some parameters. I'm making sure that as I log in or whatever that I'm not running a risk of messing up files on another server and if I ever mess it up and have to blow it up, I'm just blowing up that one instance and not messing with all the other sites that are there. So um, to me that's just one extra level of protection. And if I ever set it up so that uh, I don't currently have any clients that, that would want to get into um, the, the, the site from the back end to that level from the server standpoint. Um, but if I did, I would be able to give them keys that would just let them into that part of it and not, I wouldn't have any worry that they were getting into another part that they could mess up. Um, so when you, anytime you run um, a, the script to create a new Octopus instance, you get an email, and you, this may look familiar because it is just like any other email that you would get when you create a Drupal site. Remember, all this is just Drupal. It's just Drupal set up in a different way. And th that email gives you the log information. But the other thing that that email gives you is information that you really need to read, just like the documentation. There is information in this, meal, th this email that you want to make sure that you follow. Specifically, it gives you the um, the information to log into the um, the server that I that limited shell that I was just talking about. All that's in the e email, so don't lose that email. Or um, I mean, you can you um, you can change the password, but um, you want to make sure that that um, and then oh, and the the password will um, expire in 90 days if you don't change it. So you, um, there's a these, all these extra levels of security that if you're not a real sysadmin, you would never think of or never know about, um, but it, it, it does that for you. So when you um, create an instance of, of Octopus, like I said, it's just a satellite instance of Egger, and it looks just like Egger. If you've ever used Egger before, if you've ever seen a demo of Egger, um, there's nothing different about it. There's, it it's just Egger. Um, and um, it, it allows you to set up platforms which are um, essentially an installation of Drupal um, that is perhaps configured with a certain set of modules um, to run a certain type of site. Um, you think of it in, um, also like an, an install profile where it's um, got a collection of, of, of um, um, modules that for that site. So when, I, um, when I'm going to update, let's say, uh, Drupal uh, 12, the 7.12, it gets updated to 7.14. Um, what I would do is create a new platform that has a, the same modules that um, the uh, other mo platform had, but it has the version 7.14, um, set up the platform, then I'll run a test of the, um, well, I'll, first I'll clone my site, run a test of it, my, of migrating it to the new platform, if everything checks out, then I can do the same thing by migrating my um, live site to this new platform, and I'm safely um, doing the uh, updating that way. These are, you know, this is one site that's on this, um, and you can see that um, you have the ability to um, uh, clone and back up and all the things that Egger does. Again, I'm not really trying to give you a de demonstration of Egger, um, more just to show you that, th that this setup 
is a full Egger setup. Um, but I will give you a few tips on using it. Um, one is that um, you want to make sure that you verify your platform uh, before you do any, anything to it. Um, it. And essentially just verify, verify, verify. Before you do anything, verify. If you're going to make a clone of it, verify before you make the clone. That way you're making sure that you're not copying over a mistake. What verify does is it actually goes through, and I don't understand all, all of what it does, but um, I'm sure that Zach can, can explain it. But um, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it tests, make sure that all the paths are right, doesn't it? it, um, it uh, yeah. So, so that way, when you make a copy of it or whatever, you're 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 sure that it's um, it everything, all the 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 linkage of all the files and everything is all, all going to be valid. Um, so, another tip to know is that, and this is something that Octopus does that I didn't know when I first started up because I didn't read, um, is if you include dev in the subdomain of your site, then what it does is it turns off some of the extra caching that's going on that, um, that ha has been set up as part of um, this system. I, I, you know, I made a big deal about all this caching. Well, that's great when you're um, pushing out um, live content on, on a site, but it's not so great when you're trying to um, develop or uh, ch test out. Now, I, I, I will say that um, sites that are on um, Egger are not necessarily the best place to be developing. Um, you're probably better off developing on a local system and then pushing to a test environment and then put a test site and then pushing to a live site. Um, but if you if you if you are doing some development. Um, Make sure that you're, you've got dev in the subdomain, and that way you, you won't have problems with caching, because otherwise it'll be frustrating. I know I made these changes. I'm even clearing cache and that kind of stuff, and I'm still not seeing the changes. It's because of that. Um, to, to create a new platform, um, or, or when, when you, when you, when you want to, um, What I'm trying to say is when you want to um, update a site, as I spoke of earlier, you're creating a new platform and then you're migrating to it. Um, a lot of people really like Drush Up because it does all that stuff automatically, but um, it's not really the Egger way, even though Egger is using Drush commands to do all this stuff. The reason is that, um, that they, they say that's not the Egger way is because Drush up is kind of like you're, you're doing things blindly. You're saying, go for it. Now, there is a certain amount of backing up and stuff that Drush will do as well, but this is that, that belt and suspenders kind of approach to um, serving up your sites and, and, and making changes to them. So it's, it's very safe and secure to, to um, manage these sites. I, um, now that I see... Um, Doing it this way, uh, I realized some of the the uh, foolish things that I did in the past about just oh I'll just update this live site and boom, cross my fingers that nothing changed. Um, the, to create a new platform is actually pretty easy if you use a Drush make file. Um, there are a couple of different ways in which you can create a platform, but um, the way that I found that works best is to use a make file. And um, I, what I do is I, um, for the most part, my Drush make file doesn't declare a specific um, version of a um, module. There are some cases where maybe I might, but um, that way I'm always, when, whenever I'm creating a new platform, I'm getting the latest version. 
and, and I, but I'm always making a test and I'm always checking out my site very thoroughly before I do anything so that if I discover a problem along the way, then um, because a module maybe um, is, you know, throwing a, something hinky into the whole thing, um, you know, I can fix that. But um, this way, um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have to go through line by line in my Drush make file every time I want to make one of these. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's the best way of doing it, but it's a way that so far has worked fine for me. Um, to move a site that's on another server to Octopus is not that difficult. The instructions are, there's like about six or seven or eight steps to do that. And, oh, eight steps. <laughs> there it says right there, in eight easy steps. Um, and um, essentially what it is is your, uh, um, uh, some of the steps are just some, something simple as making sure that your permissions um, for for the files in your files directory are set right. Um, and um, then you, um, you copy over the files, and I use rsync for that. Um, I know, don't remember if these directions say to use rsync, I think they might, but rsync is a handy little um, command to uh, um, copy files over, and then um, then you make sure that all the permissions are set up. And then you um, you create your platform, and then you um, you um, install the site with the database. And then you, actually, what they tell you to do is to um, make a clone of that to um, a different, like a different subdomain or something like that, and then clone it back and. The process of that is, um, and verifying along the way, of course, then that gets all the paths of all the files and everything sorted out and pointed in the right direction. Um, so it, uh, you know, I've, I've moved several sites to my uh, um, setups and I've, I've never run into a problem doing it the way that they um, call for in that, those directions. Um, I made this point earlier. You don't have to have more than one octopus instance, but um, I think it's 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 a it's a, like I said, a keep a way of keeping a wall between your sites. Um, so one of the things I mentioned in my description of this session was that you can even set up your own local host version. And when I did when I wrote the original idea up, um, what I had in mind was this um, project. Um, that was being developed um, to uh, create a um, virtual um, Barracuda Octopus Egger setup, and they um, were prov they are providing for download um, a uh, VirtualBox image. Now, VirtualBox, if you've ever dealt with VirtualBox and VirtualBox images, um, they can be they can be very big files. We're talking like about a gigabyte file. Um, the, um, wh when, I, when I ran this and, and tested it, um, it worked. I had to monkey with it a little bit, though, because uh, when I logged in, um, I didn't get the, a graphical log into the server. Um, so, and it's kind of hard to you know, launch a web page if you don't have a graphical <laughs> um, view of the, of, of the server. So. Um, so I had to do, do some um, changes and some settings, and I think I even had to um, upload a, a few um, packages in order to be able to um, make that work. But I, I was able to get it to work. But um, as I said, about a, uh, three or four weeks ago, after I did the Nashville session, um, they, they made some changes in the system, so now putting it on a local host is really easy. Um, and they give the directions right here in the install.txt um, file. All you have to do um, is re essentially is replace the word public, which you remember was in that string of text that was um, to run the script. Um, you just change that to, um, to local. All, everything else in that um, 
that string of, of commands is the same and um, it will set it up on um, your own server. It will set up the, everything exactly the same way, although presumably it, um, it probably doesn't need the firewall um, since it's on your own machine and you've already got a firewall on your machine. Um, so I, I actually um, had some success with this, although I, it, I ended up having a problem um, with some of, on, on my setup. I was trying to do this um, kind of, as I said, I had all these presentations to do this week, and so I was kind of in a rush to, to try this, and um, I ran into some problems with um, VirtualBox that has to do not with this setup, but has to do with um, uh, my, my um, c connections, my um, network interface with VirtualBox. So I was having some internet problems. It was, it was weird that I could do some stuff from the command line, but I couldn't get web pages to come up on a browser and stuff. It's just, I need to dig in that some more. But anyway, what you will need to do if you want to try this is to go to, like, go to um, the Debian site and get a, um, get an ISO of the, um, an image of the, uh, the, the server. You don't want the, this, I should say, an a, a image of Debian. You don't want the server version, you just want an I image of just plain vanilla Debian. Um, because as we pointed out earlier, um, Barracuda takes care of all the other stuff related to the server. So anyway, um, as I said, I ran it. Um, I, I got to a certain point, and then um, it, it hiccuped as it was trying to um, connect to Drupal.org to download Drupal. And so, but it, I, what I did like was that um, it, they throw in these little cute little things into their uh, com commands, like uh, BOA Skynet welcomes you. And then there's another, it, when it's all done, it, it makes a reference to thank you and your credit card has been charged. And, and of course, it's free, but um, it's a little joke. So um, I, if we, we, when we have a little bit of time, I, can, um, I could go do a little bit of a demo with Agar if you wanted to in the setup, but um, I thought maybe um, you had some questions, so that'd probably be more valuable to you than seeing something that maybe you've already seen. Any questions? You're stunned, you're tired, you're ready to go home? All right, well, um, I really don't have anything else, so we can call it a day, and I thank you very much. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing 
is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. 
Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.